Hello? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Edmund. Um, there's been some amazing architecture being shown tonight. Um, it looks incredibly complicated, it has to be said. And um, I'm actually quite thankful that uh, I decided to become a photographer. The, um, there's a friend of mine in the UK, as uh, the architecture critic, Ollie Wainwright, who um, dubbed the phrase Instagrammable architecture. Um, he was talking about the serpentine pavilions, and he was talking about how the image was becoming so important and how almost buildings were being sort of designed with photography in mind. But then it made me sort of think in a way about um, technology and architecture and how it's affected my practice, um, how things have changed in the 20 years almost that I've been working. So really, today, what I want to talk to you about is um, about how photography has changed over 20 years, both technically and aesthetically. Um, also, I want to sort of talk slightly about how I've responded to that. And thirdly, I'd like to sort of talk a little bit about my relationship with India and um, how I like photographing over here. So really, uh, I guess we should go back. When I started as a photographer, I'd be working on a camera like this. This, this hefty beast is a, um, is a Sinar F2. Um, very heavy, very sort of serious. Each, you know, each, uh, each uh, sheet of film would be costing you know, 15, 20 pounds uh, English. But architectural photography is a very, you know, traditionally was a very, very um, time consuming and very, very technical pursuit. This is the famous photographer Julius Schulemann photographing one of the case study houses, which is probably one of the most, I mean, some of the dusk shots looking over LA, are probably some of the most um, famous pictures that you'll see. So then you also have these sort of people who, I mean, the, the, the kit was ridiculous. Well, when I was traveling, I'd be sort of carrying around about 80 kilos of um, equipment. And um, it was actually sort of becoming quite uh, sort of time consuming and quite, quite cumbersome, really. And that would affect the way you shot. But then along comes the iPhone and along comes Instagram. And essentially, everyone is a photographer. Everyone is capturing the moment. Everyone is pushing images. So you've got to sort of think about how, you know, how that is going to affect how you photograph things. How are you going to um, interact with that? So really, what I want to sort of explain to you is about how photography is very much the currency of architecture. And actually, you know, far from Instagram or, or iPhones making photography, professional photography, redundant, I think that they actually propel it to a new level. It's all about the hashtag and, and, and just getting images out. The whole sort of hierarchy of a project appearing in Domus and then eventually appearing on a blog is completely gone. But I think one really needs to sort of embrace that. So I guess talking a little bit, um, I want to talk about how my style has changed. Uh, as I say, I mean, in the past, I'd be carrying around uh, equipment that's you know, maybe 50 or 60 kilos but assistant, it, you know, to be honest, it was very, very hard work. Things, the technology has moved on. You can do amazing things. But really, actually, you, you're still capturing the same thing. But technologically, you can have a lot of fun. So I think, in a way, how I've sort of tried to change how I'm working is um, to still have a fairly traditional uh, approach, but just, just to sort of try and actually seize the moment you're looking at context, you're not worrying too much about weather, and trying to get as many people in as possible. So I'd like to talk about a few key projects that I've been photographing. Um, there's quite a few in um, India. There's also some from Mexico, and finally some from uh, Japan. So the first one, um, I think I should probably explain. I first came to, to India um, on work in 2007. I was invited to photograph a fashion school. Uh, and that, that went pretty well. A lot of friends in magazines who were all very, very excited because everyone really wants to know what is going on in India. So that led to other um, commissions for editorial, and then I, and I met a lot of other people, which led to me coming back, or you know, almost twice, sometimes three times a year. So I've worked with Samip um, for quite a few years. Uh, this was one that I photographed last year in conjunction with the uh, Architectural Review, um, where we did a uh, India issue. Um, which uh, and this project actually ended up getting getting the cover, which was which was which was quite nice, really. So um, it was about a sort of four-hour drive outside uh, Bombay, and um, 
So I think the picture on the left is sort of quite a sort of traditional architectural image. And the one on the right, I'm just sort of trying to, trying to sort of show a little bit of action, show people wandering about. In, in the past, you'd never have people, you'd never have any of these things. It would just be very, very stark and quite, quite sort of serious. I think the ability of having you know, a lot lighter equipment means you can move. You can move from A to B very, very quickly. And you know, if you can see something, like I was just sort of wandering off and I saw this amazing shadow, and you, you, you're able to capture it very, very quickly. So I spent about two days there and just sort of you know, got a feel for all the different things that were, were going on. Um, this next one, I've worked with uh, Gujad Mataru for, for many years, and um, this is this fantastically but totally bonkers house in uh, Ahmedabad that essentially, um, I mean, I call it the house with, the house with walls, but uh, that's not the official title, because essentially all the, mo all the walls move. Again, this is, I, I guess you'd put this down as a fairly sort of traditional shoot, but because uh, there are no people and no um, the clients around, but um, we're sort of just trying to sort of capture different aspects of the building. I guess it's impossible to really show uh, a building in its entirety, or, or, but if you, know, if you can sort of try, if you can convey a little bit of the sense of, of that project and what it might be like to be there, you know, I think, I think you're, you're, you're winning. Um, this was an editorial commission for Domus magazine. I, I forget exactly which year it was, maybe 2008. Um, so um, this is, uh, but uh, I, I think I shot this in the, in the, in the depths of the uh, monsoon. So actually a lot of this was sort of shot under umbrellas. So um, I thought it was really quite a sort of fantastical project. And I guess the trick is to really sort of try and sort of show all the different aspects. And I guess for an editorial commission, you're also sli sh photographing it in a slightly different manner. One of the key things in um, architectural photography is to try and sort of um, communicate the building by details, just little, little tiny little sort of fragments. So I was very sort of taken with uh, the, the bar upstairs, um, and I just loved the way the lights would, would play on the walls. Um, I think in all the houses I've photographed, and I've photographed a lot in about the last 15, 20 years, uh, this has got to be either my first or second favorite. It just, it, it really was quite fantastic. In fact, I actually photographed it over three different visits. The first one, I think, was my, my favorite. Again, it was quite sort of moody, quite, quite sort of overcast conditions. So in fact, th this was sort of mid-afternoon, but, but the lights were sort of dipping already, so you could actually sort of get a little bit of sort of transparency on it. I think this was actually for, um, I think, the, uh, uh, this year was the second year, sorry, last year was the second year that I worked with the Architecture Review. I think this, this went into the, into the first one. Uh, this is another house. Um, this is in my, in my top three as well. So, and this is, this is relatively li nearby. So they wonderfully named Ut Utsav House. This was a, um, a shoot that I did uh, last year. Um, and uh, we'd arranged to go up and photograph this house for, for Samip, and um, I was promised it would be sort of ready. But uh, I think when we got there, they were actually still finishing it off and finishing bits. And also, it was terrible weather. So we sort of decided, you know, w what were we going to do? But then actually, we thought we'd just sort of push ahead and, and um, try and try and sort of capture it in the, in the conditions that we found. So very much I was sort of trying to show the sort of context. I'm not sort of trying to over glamorize or sort of over, you know, exaggerate, you know, how glamorous a project is. I just want to sort of show, you know, where it is and, and, and why it is. So going, going back to the theme of sort of um, Instagram, I mean, this, this, this project uh, was, a, was a direct commission with, with Samib and, and um, I think really it started to getting a lot of attention because of social media. We, uh, this particular picture went onto uh, Instagram and then it was sort of getting reblogged. And then I was getting contacted by magazines who wanted to sort of publish it. 
Um, and then it got and then it got picked up by Wallpaper um, and then into different competitions. And I think last year won the the, the House of the Year with, with I mean David Ajay was one of the judges, um, which I'm delighted about. I mean I think you know photography's role is to promote architecture as you know as highly as you can, and um, Instagram and social media really do help with that. Um, we're moving a little bit away now. Um, I have this um, quite strange relationship with uh, Tado Ando, uh, which started um, because I was working on a book uh, uh, um, on Japanese architecture. And he said I could photograph his projects, but I'd have to go and meet him and discuss which ones I could use and which I couldn't. And uh, that actually ended up having a big argument about some pictures, and he wanted all the telegraph poles taken out, but I said they were great. Anyway. Um, actually sort of turned out he quite liked sort of uh, being argued with a little bit so he's now commissioning me to do certain projects and, and it's it's a relationship that's sort of ongoing maybe every year or every two years he'll ask me to do something so this one was in um, Puerto Escondido which is about an hour and a half from um, Mexico City so it's a um, an art center that uh, was sort of uh, started by um, the artist Bosco Sodi so the idea is that artists can go and stay for uh, residencies for between two weeks for up to three months. So I, I was supposed to photograph it over two days, but I, f I think I ended up sending about six, really, because, I mean, it was just, just the most stunning project. It was um, intense, uh, intensely hot, and every afternoon you'd have these sort of electrical storms that would be coming in. But I noticed they sort of almost sort of came in as, uh, as sort of clockwork. And then, so for this shot here, I think I, I, about... Um, about 30 seconds after that, the light would just die, and you'd have thunder and uh, storms of going out. So yeah, th I mean, generally they would have, um, there were about sort of between 15 and 20 artists, but uh, most of them were very, very shy, or, or I don't know, maybe they were off swimming or something. So um, which generally, I think people were just sort of caught glimpses apart from Jenny, who sort of seemed to appear in a lot of my shots. He was swimming in the pool and working on, on artwork. I, um, I picked this guy particularly because I, I, I just thought his, uh, his own personal work suited the building quite, quite well. This is a sort of classic dusk shot. There's that sort of um, golden time about sort of, you, know, you get about 10 minutes after sunset where there's just a sort of mixture of tungsten and daylight. And um, anyway, it turns out Ando was very, very happy with the pictures, but he didn't want any cactuses in the pictures. And it turns out for the local architects also, they weren't allowed to have any cactuses. So again, we had another argument, but uh, luckily the cactuses sort of stayed. Um, this was another project for uh, Ando. This was the, the, the year before. Uh, and this is a... Um, this is a rather exclusive house in uh, Monterey, which is uh, Mexico's third city. Um, again, when I got there, there was terrible weather, and I had sort of terrible weather pretty much for the whole shoot. But actually, it was one of the shoots that really convinced me to get over my fear of bad weather, because actually, I think, I think it really suits the project quite perfectly. And there's always, there's always things you can do. Um, you can shoot at dusk. You can shoot um, in the afternoon. There's, the, the, there's different sort of techniques. So again, the, the owners were very, very shy, but um, I tried to sort of catch, catch a couple of little glimpses of them. This is the boys, boys' toy room. Um, this one was probably um, one of the most fun houses I've shot. There's this uh, very talented firm called TNA Architecture, and um, in Japan, houses always have crazy names. There's a house called there's one, one studio I've worked with, and they have a house called Touch the Sky, and then there's Touch the Sky 1, Touch the Sky 2, Touch the Sky 3. This one is the Mist House, and it, it really didn't disappoint because essentially had no stairs. They'd completely taken out um, the sort of central core, and you just had this wonderful sort of slidey, um, polished concrete floor. So um, now I'm getting a bit older. My, my kids sort of seem to sort of travel with me a lot, and um, I think my son Cosmo, he used to always sort of point at my uh, cameras and sort of say that they were toys and I was going off to play. And, and he, wasn't, he wasn't wrong, really. So um, anyway, so uh, in Japan, quite often they would sort of come along and shoot. And this one, they were just having a ball all day, sliding up and down, just, just really having a good time. 
So ar architectural photography, it's not always about buildings. Um, in some ways, it's a term that refers to the sort of discipline. It's, it's, it's a certain way of seeing. You're trying to show things sort of ob objectively, but um, in, in, in quite a sort of uh, technically correct way. Um, this one, uh, again, was for uh, Mataru. This was one of the first projects I photographed in India. And every time I worked with him, there was always an elephant or a, or a camel or, or, or something. So, so this is Kativa, which is apparently refers to a, a god that used to sort of suck blood or, 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 or a, um, a demon. I, I'm not quite sure. But essentially, uh, it was a mobile blood transfusion um, collection service that would go around all the villages, create a bit of a sort of bit of a fuss and people would queue up and you know donate blood for in return for for money so we spent about a day photographing this and we took this all around Ahmedabad and and um, we sort of took it next to key landmarks and um, and then sure enough we were you know there were elephants and I think I think later on we took it and there were camels and elephants and um, actually towards the end good was like well we must get some interior shots and he's like I was like okay fine and he's like no 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 we need someone to be giving blood I was like, right, okay. And then he sat down and rolled up his sleeve and just started donating. And I actually nearly fainted, so I'm, I'm not going to show you that shot. But, uh, so I'm going to finish off with um, uh, the idea of sort of architectural photography. Uh, and for me, personally, how I see my own practice developing, it's, um, it's, it's going more towards reportage. It's going more towards... Um, trying to create stories, not necessarily scripted. So um, I put a proposal to Domus and Architectural Review to sort of go and have a look at um, the area below Miyagi that was affected by the, the tsunami. And um, they were sort of quite keen. And, and the, the idea was that we would uh, look at some of the buildings by the star architects like So Fujimoto and, and Toyo Ito. But actually, the more I sort of traveled and the more I got into the project, I really wasn't that interested in uh, the, the star architects or, or what they were doing. It, instead, you know, I still photographed it, but for me, it was much more of a sort of travelogue, much more of a sort of story about really how very, very little was being done. I mean, on this particular road here, we had a, a sat nav that was um, telling us uh, at the at the 7-Eleven to take a left, and then you sort of went along and you did take a left, and you realised that the 7-Eleven was probably just there, but it's sort of been uh, well been washed away but it was it was it, it was a very very difficult project in many ways because it was two years on and really not that much seemed to be done apart from uh, th th there was this sort of Japanese uh, thing of everything was being tidied and compartmentalized and organized and labeled and there was some um, in this one town there was a municipal uh, tsunami warning center um, which was built to uh, withstand a tsunami, um, and that had sort of become a uh, impromptu shrine. And there was, we, we, and this was this this building here. So there was a big debate about whether to sort of keep it, and and uh, I think they actually have now because, yeah, I mean, just just the devastation really was 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 quite intense. Somehow these images are sort of quintessentially Japanese. Everything is sort of miniature, but because it's all sort of squashed and all sort of neatly laid out, and uh, it kind of s somehow it sort of epitomizes me to me the, 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 the you know the way they were sort of dealing with it or trying to deal with it. <laughs> 